Number 20, Julia Stoltz... Oh, Julia, nobody can pronounce your last name. <laughs> Stoltzfus. <laughs> Stoltzfus. Okay, maybe I can. My brother brought up 2 Kings 20, ch chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, to challenge the goodness of God. He saw imbalance of justice when bears came to maul 40 boys for making fun of Elisha. How would you respond to this? Um... At first, I'm really curious what it is your your uh, brother is saying. Is he saying, I think God really did this, and I think it was wrong? Or is he saying, I don't think God did it, because God would never do that sort of thing, and that proves that the Bible's not inspired because it has God doing something I don't think he would do. Like, I, would, I would want to know first which one of those he's saying, and if he's like, that proves that God didn't really inspire, I would go to other things to try to prove the inspiration of scripture to him and prophecy and um, talk about Jesus and all that. Um, but this is what it's like. Sometimes with, with, with witnessing, it can be like playing whack-a-mole because you have things where you're like, this shouldn't be the central issue you're thinking about when you're talking about coming to Christ, but yet it's the thing you'll throw up. What I would want to know, Julia, and for you to pay attention to this, if you answer this question sufficiently, if you give decent, reasonable responses to, to your brother, does he care after you do? And don't get mad at him if he doesn't. It's just a diagnostic tool, right? Let's say you answer this question to his satisfaction. Does he care? And does he go, wow, I need to rethink whether God is really good, like you said? Or does he go, oh yeah? Well, here's another objection. And here's another objection. And then it's like whack-a-mole, where I answer objections that the objector doesn't care about. Now, why is that important? And I don't want to get mad about it. I just want to recognize it because if you keep doing that, you realize you're solving problems they don't care about. You need to find the problems they do care about and solve those. So then you ask them questions like, what objection to Christianity that if, if I could bring you good evidence or good answers, it might actually bring you closer to Jesus? Give me one of those objections. What objection will change you if you get good answers for it? versus just jumping to another objection. Because this strikes me as one that people just throw out there because it's a gotcha thing and they don't usually care that much about the answer, in my opinion. And But I'll try to bring some thoughts anyways. So um, Elisha, he's he goes up from there to Bethel. And while he was going up on the way, some small boys, and that, that's what it, the ESV puts it as, small boys, and there's a huge debate on that, came out of the city and jeered at him saying, go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. And he turned around and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. From there, he went on to Mount Carmel. And from there, he returned to Samaria. So this is like the, 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 the killing of these, the ESV says, small boys. Let's look at some other translations. What, what do they say about verse 23 there? Who is it that's being killed here? Some youths, New King James Version. Some youths came from the city and mocked him. NIV. It says, um, as he's walking the road, some boys. Okay. So we have youth, which would imply perhaps to my English ears, older, like youth. I think when I say youth, I usually think of teenagers or, or older. Um, probably not that much older, probably teenage range. Um, but when he, ESV says small boys, right? You're thinking, oh, well, like small boys. So like four-year-olds or something like that. And then the NIV uh, it says just some boys, which could be generic and who knows what age they are. Um, like the RSV, um, it says small boys RSV. Now, interesting, the the ESV is a rendition of the RSV. The RSV is the foundational text for the ESV, which is a little surprising because I think the ESV is a lot better than the RSV most of the time. And you can go through other translations. And what here's what I would share with you or your brother uh, is that when you see these different translations translating the same term and it feels like it means something different, it's at least revealing to you that behind the translation is a Hebrew phrase that they're not 100% sure how they want to render or there's a debate on it, right? Like how old were these kids? It's not entirely clear. Now, if you look up this term, this exact Hebrew term, it does often refer to more like children or pre-adolescent, like prepubescent type boys, boys that are at least, I would maybe not prepubescent, maybe that's too young, but boys that are like not really responsible and trustworthy with, with responsibilities yet. It often refers to that, but does it always refer to that? And is that what it means in this passage? Um, so there's a passage where Solomon is becoming king and is referred to as 
The same Hebrew word there small, for small boys. Same Hebrew word. Now Solomon was an adult at the time, absolutely an adult. What was what was being said about Solomon? David kind of kind of puts him in his place before he becomes king, and he's like, "Look, this, this little kid is going to be taking over the throne." And what's being said about him is about his maturity level and not about his age. Isn't that interesting? Now, there, there, there's a possibility that one of the things that we're getting here is that these kids are punks, and that's what's being said about them. These small boys are punks. Now, for those who picture it being like five and four year olds. Because there are some who suggest that five, six-year-old kids, there is that would imply that there is a gang of over forty, like five-year-old kids predominantly, and they're coming out of the city to harass the prophet of God as a group, and the setting starts to look silly, like these kids, and then they go, "Go up, you bald head, go up." This is a specific insult that's that's being uh, said to him. There, there's context of the phrase "go up" as well that implies, like. Um, rationality and reasoning skills. I know James Bijan is one scholar who he wrote like a little paper on this about them using the phrase "go up, you bald head." They're trying to suggest that um, that uh, something negative about Jerusalem, effectively, I think, and that implies a lot more is going on, a lot more intellectually is going on with this insult than merely little kids making fun of somebody. Okay, so already at least I'm going to say say this. For those who were confident that these were just like these little kids that got that got killed by bears and how evil was that, I think that that isn't something they should be confident about. It's not something they should be confident about. It's entirely possible it's a, a group of punk kids. Um, you know, five and six year olds don't usually run around in crews like that, but teenagers would sometimes do that. Teenagers, or maybe even older, going out in you know, what age do people usually go out in in crowds of youth where they might be causing trouble for other people and that sort of thing? And that, that's a little bit of an older age. So it could be being used to deride them as being sort of these immature brats and not just speaking of their age. Um, in the end, though, I think the bottom line is this. Whenever we're confronted, and this is a principle I would throw out for your brother to consider, whenever we're confronted with God bringing judgment down on somebody and we think they didn't deserve that, the hypothetical here is God Almighty, who knows all things and is actually holy. He's a worse judge than me, who knows this much. Two verses. I know two verses about the situation in these people, and I can overrule God's judgment and declare that I have discovered that God was wrong and he should not have done that. That's a general mentality that I think is alien, obviously alien to Christianity, alien to any scriptural concepts where I would look at and say, God, you shouldn't have done that. That was wrong of you. There's times in scripture where people kind of look at God that way. Like Hosea feels like, God, you couldn't do that. You couldn't judge people like that. And then later he's like, yeah, I, I didn't realize how bad they were. And that's actually the key is I didn't realize how bad they were. When you start to realize how evil sin is and how evil the sin they're doing in this, in this scenario is, you would start to realize that God's judgment was just and right. The people of Israel are generally rebelling against God who owns them, who rightly can be the only one who's, who owns all of us and who has blessed them and called them out and called them his children and given them his laws and offered them protection. And now they're rejecting him, rejecting his prophet. And they're mocking the messenger of God who's sent to bring them back to him, to bring them even deliverance. Right, but when Elisha is out there, who who gets delivered? Like a, a a Gentile widow instead of instead of the Jewish people because they're just rejecting ultimately what God is doing in, in their lives. That rejection is embodied by this group of rebellious people who mock and ridicule the prophet of God and therefore mock and ridicule God Himself. How big of a deal is that sin? Well, it depends on how much you respect God. If you highly respect God you will think it's a pretty big sin. If you have low respect for God, as it seems your brother might, then you probably won't think it's that big of a sin. And then you might think that you have better judgment than God. Everything about that is problematic. Even if you, at the end of the day, looked at this verse and you go, I don't know what was what was going on there. I don't know how old these kids were. I don't know how to reconcile that and explain that it was just. But I know this, God does what's right. And it would be utter folly for any human to shake their fist at the creator and say, I have a bet. I have better knowledge of the scenario and better, a better sense of justice than you've got. This is incredible folly. So the hypothetical of God did something I don't like. And so I shake my fist at him that never works because it ignores 
God's holiness, God's goodness, God's wisdom and knowledge. And it attributes those things to me. I'm, I'm holier than God. I have more wisdom than God on this issue. I have more knowledge. Apparently I know something, I know enough to be able to be the judge of this thing. And ultimately I would make a better judgment than God on uh, this connects to arrogance and not anything more than that. I think is that going to help your brother? I don't know. You might just get mad, <laughs> but sometimes people have to get mad because that's what the truth is doing to them. And then maybe after they get mad, they get sad. Then after they get sad, they get glad. <laughs> that's, that's the hope. That's the hope. We might, we have to just share the truth and see what happens when we do. So I, I, I hope that has been fruitful for you guys and helpful. I'll remember to put those videos in the links, links down below. I think I mentioned three or so videos. I'll be linking down below. Just give me a few minutes. Thank you guys for being here. That was question 20. I don't think we got yeah, nothing else. I will see you next Friday. I will be doing a Q and a next Friday. Don't know what will happen for the rest of the December, but hopefully I'll see you then. Um, let's pray. Um, Father, we, we ask for wisdom, uh, as we encounter the world and we want to show them the goodness of, of scripture and the goodness of Christianity and the truthfulness of Christianity. I mean, those are two very different, but connected things. We want to show them that Christianity is good and that it's true. We pray that you'd help us to be witnesses that can co communicate that stuff, Lord, that we would be able to build bridges, but without giving in to lies, without, without yielding to false things that people are saying and believing at the same time as we're trying to build a bridge with them. We just pray for that wisdom and discernment. And we ask that you help give us courage to be able to handle it. If people respond negatively, we, we pray that you let us be your witnesses in Jesus name. Amen. Alrighty.